Hi, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, before we get started, I do want to make a couple of announcements because I didn't get the flyers out in time this, uh, this month. First of all, you may notice that for the first time, this program is being recorded. It's going to be, we're going to start putting these up on our YouTube channel for the folks who can't see them or would like to see them again. If you don't want to have your face or voice in the uh, recording, there will be some time at the end for questions and we will turn the cameras off. And if you don't want to be in here, I would sit this table right here because you'll be preserved for all posterity to see. Or you can tell your grandkids and say, hey, look how cool grandma is. <laughs> um, next month, our Lunch and Learn topic will be Edge Walking with Judy Neal. That's really hard to explain on a little flyer, but the idea is people who have one foot in two worlds, like they straddle cultures, or spirituality and secular, or private and public business. Anybody who does that is an edge walker. And Judy Neal's gonna talk on that, and it's really exciting. Uh, Serendipity and Fabulous Fiction book clubs are not meeting at the library this month, but they will be back in January. Serendipity with No Safe Place by Patterson and Fabulous Fiction with The Silkworm by Robert Galbraith. And of course, we have copies of all of these books in the library. And now, you don't want to listen to me because you've just seen him at our geek events and I've just been informed he has a secret identity as a superhero, Eco Geeko. And, but we just know him as Jason. And he's gonna to come to talk about the Maker Movement. Thank you, thank you. So, um, I was asked to do this event and uh, like she said, I actually have a secret identity. I normally dress up as a superhero and go to schools all over Northwest Arkansas with green hair and a mask and uh, talk about sustainability, um, how to save the planet, how to um, reduce, reuse, recycle, things like that. Um, and that's kind of my passion. But um, behind the scenes, I'm a maker, I'm a builder, I'm a tinkerer, and that's kind of what got me into all of this. Um, we kind of all are makers, and, and writing this was actually one of the hardest things I've ever done, because I know what to talk about for sustainability. I, I've never been asked to, to talk to groups about what I do behind the scenes. So bear with me if I, if I get lost in my speech. Um, so yes, my name is Jason Quayle. Uh, I live right here uh, down the road in Bentonville. I'm originally from New York State. Uh, for about 14 years before that, I was born and raised in Pennsylvania. Um, as a kid, we, we all are kind of that way. Uh, we're makers. So a maker, um, a maker is a person that makes something. Uh, I bet you everybody in this room is, is probably a maker. Uh, there's been a lot of famous ones in through history. Um, Edison, the Wright brothers, Da Vinci, Tesla. Tesla is one of my favorites. He was kind of the underdog, but uh, most of his stuff is actually still around today. We, we've been making for forever, basically. Um, the, one of the things people don't realize um, is whenever we build something from scratch, we've actually been doing that forever. The things like the wheel, um, when the first caveman created the wheel, no offense, Scott, I know it's, you know, like I'm called caveman. Um, when the first caveman created the wheel, somebody had to create the chisel before that. So we've been making since the beginning of time. Um, it's not really something that, that a lot of people think of as they do every day, but you are a maker in, in essence. Um, I remember building things as a kid with Legos. Uh, here. Nowadays I, I build larger Legos instead of things with Legos. Uh, 300 times the normal size, and he's still short. <laughs> so, so I remember building things with Legos um, one of the things that we did with those Legos, of course, um, I would also build other toys out of toys. You know, who, what kid doesn't like to take apart something, put it back together, and, and see what they can make out of it? I had transformers that I'd take the transforming parts out, and whenever I took them off, I'd put them back together in a different way. They wouldn't transform anymore, but I'd have a really cool guy or, or a little <laughs> tractor or something whenever I was done. There's my caveman building the wheel. Of course, it's a Lego wheel. <laughs> um, so everybody 
really is a maker. Um, makers come in all varieties. I bet everyone here is a maker of some sorts. There's bakers, quilters, um, gadgeteers, painters. We, we're all basically makers of some sorts. The maker community isn't just a bunch of us guys and girls that get together and create large things that would not get us through airport security. We're actually, <laughs> we're actually groups of people that like to do stuff. Um, quilting, making. When I was growing up as a kid, I was in a matriarchal family. Um, I had to take home ec. I had to learn to sew, cook. Um, I knitted my own scarf every year for when I was, I'm talking when I was seven or eight. Um, of course, I, I dropped a stitch every now and then, but you know, quilting is quilting and scarves are scarves. Um, I, I definitely don't remember how to do that anymore, but that got me going. Um, that got my mind racing as to what, I could, what else I could do. Um, there it goes. So nothing has really changed uh, for people making something from something else, but something has changed in the last few years with what people do with it when they build something. <clears throat> they brag about it. Um, I, I mean, blatantly, they brag. I love showing off my stuff. It, it's what we do. Um, and what has changed in the last probably 30 years is we have this wonderful thing called the internet, the World Wide Web. Um, you're over here somewhere. So, um, and this is an actual map of the internet right now. 2014 updated model. Um, it may not look like much because of the way the projector is, but you can look these up online. The, the internet has basically changed the way that makers make, the, it, it's changed the world. It's not just about cats, right? Um, the maker movement has been all around us for a long time, but with all of us using the internet as their show and tell, anyone can see how it's done. And, and then here's the fun part. We can add to it or change it or make it something completely different. Um, so, for example, the, the um, full-size battle droid here from Star Wars. If you guys don't know who that is, that's, that's the battle droid. Um, the guy who, who did this design made it at one-fourth scale. So he was only supposed to be about six inches tall. Um, so 3D printing it, and yes, he's completely 3D printed on that printer right there. Uh, 3D printing it, you can actually tell the software. It's kind of like Photoshop for objects. So I told the software to be bigger. I just basically scaled the whole thing up 400 times and sliced it up in the software and created something that's full size. If, if I stand him up, he's six feet tall, which is exactly the same height in the movie. Um, I'm working on his backpack right now, because we all know he's got a little antenna backpack in the back. Um, and of course, he's got to have the blaster. Um, it's been suggested a million times to put something in him so that he says the word Roger Roger all the time. But I, I'm going to put him in my lab, so I don't want him saying that all the time. So that probably won't happen. I'll be walking by a lot. Um, um, so that's, that's the cool thing. Um, other things like this, the, the thing that won't get me through airport security, I'm sure. Um, this is also a design by a gentleman. His user ID is Sammy I Am. Um, he's, a, he's an inventor, a creator, a maker like us. And what he did was the antiquated floppy drive with floppy disks, remember we all had three and a half inch floppies long before we had thumb drives. Um, they, remember they buzz? You pop the disk in and go zzz, 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 right? So he took a bunch of the antiquated devices and he decided to take five or six of them and knowing that the buzzes could be tuned like a musical instrument, he made them actually play music. So with that idea, he made what's called the moppy. It's a musical floppy. Um, yeah, great name, right? So, so what he did was he, and then he released it on the internet. And in building this project, I literally saved probably a dozen different websites of different people that built different things out of it and made it work. You can do it with floppy drives, you can do it with hard drives, you can do it with simple little motors. Um, but in the end, all it is, and we're gonna play a song here, all it is is a bunch of the buzzes from the floppy drive that we all remember from you know a decade ago playing music. Turn up the speakers. Unfortunately, like I said, it's not really that loud. Um, we can also look at it after the end if you want. Um, so, but what it does is it takes the buzzes from there 
and it turns them into the musical notes of Um, but basically it takes the musical notes and turns them into a MIDI file, and then the MIDI file is played out throughout. So, um, and the fun thing is, it, it really serves no purpose. It, it's not something that, it, it truly doesn't. Um, it was a fun project. I learned a lot about wiring with the, uh, these little controller boards called Arduinos. Um, there's a whole industry out there that builds boards just to hack and build and modify. Um, and you guys can take a look at it whenever we're done. Um, the world is a much smaller place than whenever we were kids. If you brag about your Lego creation uh, at, with your friends at schools, uh, it was called show and tell. Uh, well, now we have the internet, and we have great things that are bigger show and tells. Um, we have places like Instructables.com or Thingiverse by MakerBot. Um, these places are, are free to go to, free to have accounts on. You can show off literally anything. Um, a lot of the stuff that I actually do every day comes from these websites. The Instructables is literally anything from bakers to makers to creators, um, quilters, painters. Candlestick makers. Candlestick makers. Yeah, there's actually candlestick makers in there. Um, uh, we know how the biggest show and uh, we now have the biggest show and tell on earth with websites like these um, and also maker fairs and tinker fests. We all have a way to show off what what we mean to people all around the world, and they can see it instead of our teacher in our first grade class, like whenever we were kids. Um, how many people loved show and tell? It's the best thing in the world. You know, you got to brag. I mean, wh why not, right? Um, it, it was the it was what it was. So um, it's this sharing of ideas that speeds at the speed of light that is sparking the maker community into what it is today and what it will be for years to come. Uh, I look at the maker evolution, or as the next evolution of society. We as people learn from our past and make things for our future. We take the knowledge that our forefathers created and turn it into something that no one has ever seen before. The cool thing is today we have something we didn't have 30 years ago, the internet. Ideas spread across the planet, even into space in mere seconds, uh, where in the past it took years for only the most famous things to, get, uh, um, to make it around the world. Bell invented the phone in 1876, but it took almost 20 years to become common. But whenever something like the iPhone came out, it spread in days. Um, so the, the maker community has been there forever, but now it's something that it, it's a formidable uh, group because we can share those ideas. And like I said, ideas create ideas. So of course we make the, the droid bigger or we make the moppy look different. Um, we can modify things on the fly nowadays. Um, so I'm actually part of a group, a growing group here in uh, Northwest Arkansas called Take Three NWA. Um, uh, I'm the vice president. Scott over here is the president. Call him out again. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> so um, uh, we're trying to create a maker space here in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, we're actually looking at Bentonville as the best place to have it. The um, Bentonville area is it, it's not really a central location. But as we all know, Bentonville has 20,000 people go there every day, and that's not counting the people that already live there. Uh, and well, of course, technology is at the forefront of what's around here. We've got, of course, we've got Walmart, we've got Tyson, and we've got J.B. Hunt, and we've got all these companies around us that have to have technology involved in order to create what they're doing the next day. Makerspaces are a way for the people that work in the technology industry uh, specifically the technology industry, it's a way for us to cool off. It's, it's our, it's our downtime. Our brains work different. We're always thinking of something new. So, um, maker spaces are places that we do that. Um, the name comes, take, take three, a little bit about take three. The name actually comes because, uh, there's been two prior tries, not by us, but of, um, maker spaces in the, in the Northwest Arkansas area over the past, probably what, decade? Yeah. Uh, they both failed. Um, it might have been for money, it might have been for participation, it might have been they jumped into it too fast. But Take 3 came from that. Uh, a lot of people might be asking, what's a maker space? So think of a maker space as a cross between a library like this 
and a gym. You pay a gym membership to go in and use the equipment and you exercise. Well, a maker space is that, but only for tools. So you would go into the um, maker space and you pay a monthly fee. You know, we gotta keep the doors open somehow. You pay the monthly fee and we keep that going for you. We, we give you access to all these tools. And the way it's like a library is, we'd also all be sharing ideas. We'd be creating things. We'd be sharing our, our, our projects. We'd be showing off. We're bragging, and that's what we do. Um, those things right there are what makes a makerspace awesome. Makerspaces are actually huge all over the world. Uh, there's uh, several makerspaces that have turned into big business. For example, there's a makerspace in New York City that this device right here came out of. Uh, MakerBot Industries was created in the makerspace in New York City as a project. A bunch of guys sat around and said, hey, you know what? We, we build our own 3D printers. What if we sold them? Um, the first couple of models were made of wood and they were you know, not as shiny as this one, but the company is now multi-million dollars, and last year was sold for, for, I think it was close to a billion to, a, to another 3D printer company. Um, not too shabby for only being open since 2004. So the, the, the industries um, can use makerspaces as incubators. They can use makerspaces as places to generate ideas. Uh, many companies, actually um, in Detroit, a lot of the car industries, love the makerspaces because they can go into a makerspace and say, we're going to have a contest. I need to solve this problem. Here's your prize. And the prize ain't too shabby either. Sometimes it's a car, sometimes it's money, sometimes it's that you get hired on. And so they have this contest in the makerspace and that creates everybody buzzing and trying to figure these things out. And the makerspace is a great place to go um, because you, you've got access to brain. You know, you got the brain power, the brain trust of the makerspace. Um, So if you're interested in our makerspace and you want to join, and I, couple, I see a couple of makerspace or take threes out there right now. Um, right now we're really big on Facebook. Um, so <laughs> unfortunately that's, that seems to be the only place we can drum up some uh, people talking, but we do, we do talk and share and um, trade ideas. And uh, last week or a few weeks ago I needed a file converted and I didn't have the software and within probably half an hour of posting on Facebook somebody converted it and emailed it back to me because I didn't have the tools to convert it. It was actually the version 2.0 of my guitar over here. So, the, the guitar is 3D printed, except for the neck, and the file that I got to print the neck was in the wrong format. I couldn't, I couldn't uh, uh, put it through my printer, so he converted it and sent it back to me. So now the next version of this, 2.0, will have a uh, 3D printed neck along with all the little knickknacks that I'm slowly converting over to 3D printed. So, and it's not fully playable right now. Version 1.0 warped on me. If anybody knows anything about guitars, you can tell that's a little warped. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 200 pounds of pressure. Basically, I didn't print it thick enough. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it, it, the makerspace, even online, is, is, a, is a great place. So, we all have these deep down, this deep down need to create when we are children. Uh, for some of us, though, we keep it whenever we grow up. Bakers, quilters, you, you keep going, right? You, you have painters. You just want to do what you do. You, you love your passion. Um, I actually work in an a office that I'm a teacher. I, I train new technicians whenever they come on board, and I teach them how to fix things. But I always try to find ways to make inside of that um, job. So I'm always the guy that everybody goes to whenever they need the... PowerPoint presentation, or they want the, you know, the, the manual change or something out of Maker. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a fun thing to do. I kind of sneak them in there, right? So um, that's that's my presentation. But I did leave time for questions, and I was also going to show you. I know a lot of you came just for the 3D printer, so I was going to show you how that worked as well. Um, so any questions? What's that on your face? What's that on my face? <laughs> <laughs> um, what's that on my face? It's my cell phone. Uh, that's why I tell most people, uh, when you don't know what it is, I tell people it's a cell phone. It's actually Google Blast. Um, as, a, as a person that loves technology, I live in front of the bleeding edge is what I say. Uh, basically, it does everything your cell phone does, everything your computer does. It's internet access, it's text messages, it's YouTube, it's email, it's you name it, it's up here instead of on the, the phone or pulling out the phone all the time. 
Uh, it's got voice coming in control, it's got a mouse pad here, it's even got an eye, a tracking camera that tracks my eye movement so I can look around the screen and look around. Uh, smart watches are, are all the rage right now, but I kind of went in front of that, became a beta tester for that. Yes? Have you seen a difference in the children that you are presenting your program to? Are they getting more excited about creating for the future, or are they just like, no? So she asked, are, are the children that I present to getting more excited about the future? future? Yes, definitely. Um, whenever I show off, uh, especially the 3D printer, it's kind of a cool technology. When I show the 3D printer in Maker Fairs, and I have shown it to, to all the friends that come over, you know, my, I have three boys, so when they friends come over, they see it. Um, it changes their mind. They're like, oh, 3D printers are something that you, know, you only see on TV, you only see on YouTube. And here's this guy that lives down the street that has one in his house. Um, so yeah, they, they kind of their their minds go back to this is possible, which is really cool. Um, if this person can do it, why can't I? Type mentality. And they also pick up the idea that this isn't something that is only on YouTube. It's only on Facebook. It's something that's real. They can physically walk up and and you know put on the Iron Man helmet that's 3D printed, as opposed to oh look, it's behind glass at a museum. Um, it really gets their gears going. Uh, as they go up in age, the, the high schoolers, the, the older children, they actually, uh, most of the schools in the area are starting to have 3D printers now. Um, so it, it's kind of like, okay, they're at school, they're not accessible except for whenever there's class. But of course you can buy them. A um, uh, big misconception about 3D printers is they're, they're not expensive. The, the cheaper ones are 200 bucks. So, so that's a big misconception. So they also they come up and see this, and they're like, that that's a mess. But look at the cool thing it does. You know, um, this is what I can do with a 3D printer. They they get their mind going, and, and they're like sponges. Of course, they they suck it right up. So, yes. Could you talk a little bit about the relationship between making and crowdsourcing, and especially crowdfunding? Okay, great question. So the the question is how it, the maker community ties in with crowdfunding and crowdsourcing. Um, I, I can definitely speak firsthand from crowdsourcing from the, the Facebook community. Uh, as I said, we're really big on Facebook. Our maker space is, is kind of that. Um, just just from asking you know online, can somebody convert a file? They that one guy stepped up and said, Yeah, I have the software that'll convert the file. So that's small minded. But um, the cool thing is, crowdsourcing, you've got Instructables.com, you have websites that give you access to other people's ideas, or, or uh, maybe you're working on a project and you need an idea of how to do something. Um, one thing I'll, I'll give you a pro tip for, if, if you want to become a maker and you want to use websites as your, as your sources, become a Google Ninja. You really got to know how to change the wording of something to know how. Don't, don't think that the, the, web, the search engine is going to just give it to you. You know, try every plausible idea. Because um, you really gotta search deep for what you're, whenever you're trying to modify something. But the crowdsourcing thing, um, many, many people do it all the time. Um, there's, there's companies out there, there's actual companies out there that will pay for contests. That's a crowdsource that a lot of people do um, for the ideas. And they, the winner may not have the 100, you know, 100 percent of the idea, but the, even the third and fourth and fifth placers will. Um, crowdfunding. Um, crowdfunding is huge. Uh, websites like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, those websites right there, they get a lot of inventions right off the ground. They keep things going. Um, the, the crowdfunding uh, arena, you only need two or three dollars, and then you have a piece of that, uh, that idea. Uh, I don't wear it, but I actually bought a watch off uh, Kickstarter. If you don't know what Kickstarter is, it's a, it's a crowdsource uh, money program. You go on the website, you create an account. If you get, if somebody puts their idea up there and you think that idea is good, you pay them money. Now you might give them a dollar or two, and they can turn around. And, you know, they'll they'll have that dollar or two. They'll say thank you. But say my watch cost seventy five dollars that I got from this website. That watch, I actually gave them seventy five dollars, and I got one of the first run. You know, they got the business off the ground from that. The crowdfunding aspect of that gets the company going. Companies that didn't exist before. Lots of 3D printer companies started this way. They, they get a crowdfunding through Kickstarter. They got their printer going. Their printer was slightly different than everybody else's, and it took off. Um, the, the ideas that people generate nowadays, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago, you'd need to go up to one or two people in the world that are rich and say, hey, 
do you think my idea is cool? Because I do, and can I have money? Nowadays, if a thousand people give you a dollar, you've got a thousand dollars to get your project going. Um, it's really changed the face of makers. A lot of people will hold their ideas back just to Kickstarter them or Indiegogo them. And I, I don't see that as a problem. If your idea is great, you know, you want to make money off of it, go right ahead. Uh, but most of the time, you know, the maker community is great because we all share ideas. So it may not be 100% open source, but it's going to be something that everybody can share in, in the long run of things. Maybe they'll keep the proprietary part, but they'll tell you how to interface with it. So it, it's really changed the way that maker communities worked, and it wouldn't have happened without the, the big old World Wide Web. So, so, any other questions? What would it take to get a makerspace in this area? What would it take to get a makerspace in there in this area? So, so I, I think um, money. <laughs> I mean, in, in the end, money. So, so an ideal number would probably be upwards of fifty thousand dollars, just so that we're safe. Um, the prior two we found out weren't very. They didn't really raise enough money. They didn't. They didn't uh, think past six months, or they didn't know how to keep the doors open next year. Um, a makerspace can be either not-for-profit or profit. If you go not-for-profit, it actually helps you out a little bit more uh, the way we've looked into it, uh, but it also hinders you in, in several ways. The not-for-profit side of a makerspace would mean that you, you, everything you pull in, you, of course, use it towards the makerspace, um, but you would also outreach to the community. The, the profit ones, they sometimes keep your ideas or they want a, a, a chunk of your idea or something. Not all of them do it, but it does happen. Um, but but if, if you really want the doors open, you want a building, um, insurance alone is through the roof. When did you say that 50,000 is the bottom end of that? Yeah, yeah, you're, that's why I said upwards of 50. You're, you're really starting to, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's probably just to keep the doors open for probably a year and a half to be safe. And that doesn't include the equipment that we have to put in. Right. So we're looking at probably closer to 200 yeah. to really be able to do what we want to do, be able to put the gear, the equipment in, get a space, and keep it open for, uh, you know, until we start making money. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you. The, 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 it, you got to look at things from, uh, from a big perspective. A makerspace is, isn't a business, it's not a company, you don't make money off of it. Even a profitable makerspace isn't going to make a lot of money every year uh, because they basically got to keep their doors open, they got to pay the electric bill, uh, internet, you know, water, the, the, the bare necessities, and then the insurance of course is really high only for the mere fact that you're going to have a welding torch in the back, a 3D printer in the front, of somebody baking cookies in the corner all at the same time. So you got to be careful of those things, you know, you got to... CNC machines are, are, you know, you don't want to get zapped on something. Um, plasma cutters, things like that. If you want a fully loaded maker space, your, your insurance is through the roof. Um, but yeah, so in the end, um, 50 is probably lowballing it. But in, you know, in the long term things, it would keep it open more than the, the prior two tests. I'm going to call them tests because they obviously didn't make it and we learned from that. Um, so yeah, somebody else had a question. Um, how have doctors and engineers? Maker spaces. Um, uh, I know for uh, for a fact in Detroit uh, we had the big car bubble pop. You know, a good seven or eight years, nine, nine years ago now, whenever all the car industries kind of just puttered out. Uh, when they laid off the industry workers, the factory workers, a lot of them were makers. They were tinkers. They wanted to build their own cars. They wanted to build their own machines. Um, Detroit's maker spaces just skyrocketed. People had that need to to go in there and and um, build something new because they didn't have the money anymore. They, they just lost their job. But the car industry did step in and start paying for some of the maker spaces to exist. So they, they turned around and they then, you know, had those contests. They helped them out. They, they basically kept the people in the area in order to make sure that people didn't leave. You know, you have a big, huge workforce like that. The car bubble is not going to be gone forever. That, that gave the, them a reason to stick around. You know, they might be selling pizza, you know, delivering pizza one day, but at night they can go in and print their idea or something. Um, I, don't know too, I don't know much about the doctors. You know, medical industry using actual maker spaces. I know they love 3D printers and they love all this technology. Uh, not so much a mafia, but... In Stanford and some other uh, maker, maker areas, there's uh, bio citizen science. 
bio, uh, like the running major spaces as bio labs, essentially. Ah, okay. I did not know about that. Uh, I know Stanford has one. Cool. For citizen science. Um, the the actual maker, you know, a doctor himself, he they they love the three D printer. They can visualize something. They can hold it. They can look at it outside of the human body. So it, it's 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 an incubator. It's a place that people build ideas and keep people around. Having a maker space in a community would um, give somebody a place to go to have access to things they didn't have before. Um, we've had several people in the last few months join our Take Three NWA Facebook page because they came from other cities that already had maker spaces that they were a part of that they don't have access to anymore. They might have had access to all those tools, but they only had one or two at home. So. When they came here, they looked us up, they found us, they joined. Uh, hopefully they can help us you know, get ours actually in a physical location. It doesn't have to be big. This room alone would start a makerspace. So you just have to put it together. What kind of tools are you talking about? Uh, tools, literally anything. Um, there would be a, tools such as woodworking, saw, different types of saws. Uh, you, that would get things started. 3D printers, of course. CNC machines are big. Um, the larger the CNC, the better. Plasma cutters, welding torches. Oh, CNC. Sorry, computer numerical control. Uh, basically, uh, if this were a CNC, there's a big cutter that goes down on the piece of wood and cuts it in an exact, in an exact pattern every time. So it, it's in the old days we all had our little Dremel and we'd sit there and you know cut the wood and decorate and all that stuff. A CNC would be a computer controlled machine that would actually sit there and cut the pattern every time the same way. Um, there's a lot of companies that use CNC machines, or a lot of actually local businesses that use CNC machines to decorate the, the wood or carve into the wood a pattern. Uh, you can do really intricate all the way down to just a simple outline. So, lasers? Lasers, yes. Vinyl cutters. Vinyl cutters, yeah, your sign machines are a lot, a lot of sign machines are called vinyl cutters. They're basically just CNC machines. So anytime you see the the, the cool sticker on the door that looks like it was painted, but it's actually a sticker. Yeah, like these things right here. I put the danger stickers on here. Uh, those are basically complex CNC machines, computer and numerical controls. Yes. Oh, and we now have a kitchen too. If, if we have a maker space, I'd have a whole kitchen for people to bake cookies and cakes and whatnot. Right? Yeah, you are basically the person of the future. So. Looking at what we are today, what one item that actually all of us use, like maybe a toothbrush, that's not going to be in existence in say 20 years? Oh, that's a big question. What item will not be existent? I, I, I thank you for the comment, or the, the futurist comment. Thank you. Um, what item? What item would not be in the future because of this? Oh, there's a CNC. So, um, what item would not be in the future based on what we have nowadays? Um, I don't really know. Um, I know one thing that's disappeared in the past, and landline phones are pretty much starting to become the way the, you know, in the past. Um, in the size of the cell phones, you, the first ones were about this big. Oh yeah, they just shrunk down. I don't know. I don't know if I ever. I've never really thought about what would disappear because of the, you know, the way future technology is going. Um, I mean, I'm kind of biased. I think smartwatches won't make it too far, probably in the next decade. Because we're all gonna have iPhones. So, um, VHS tapes. What? VHS tapes. VHS tapes died. Yeah, we've we floppy drives. They disappeared. Um, television as we know it. Television definitely as we know it. So so that probably would be the best one. That's a great one. So there's a um, televisions probably are one that I would say. Thank you. That would probably disappear as we know them in the next probably 10 to 15 years. Right now, there is a, a little community of people that can make three-dimensional TVs that actually, you know, the, it looks like the Help Me Obi-Wan hologram in front of you. Um, there's whole maker communities that are working on that, that hologram type. And it's not what you think it is. It's not something that you can reach out and put your hand through. Um, it's much more conventional. There, there's, it's an upside-down glass pyramid that the image is projected onto, and it looks 3D if you walk around it. So that would be the first iteration. Um, uh, persistence of vision option. Persistence of vision is whenever you spin something really fast and the lights blink, you can kind of see a picture. That's another option. So if they can get those higher resolution, the flat screen that we all see every day, 
would probably start to go away real fast. Um, the, here's a word for you, voxel, the goal lines will be hit. So. Um, we, we were pretty close, like Jason said, taught in the past with setting, trying to set a, uh, a date. Um, and as you said, apathy is our enemy, where we have a lot of folks that come on and want to participate, and then they, uh, they disappear. Um, we, Jason and I went to uh, the uh, Kansas City Maker Fair last year, or this year, and so Jason and I went to the Kansas City Maker Fair, all at Kansas and so forth, um, uh, this year, and we spoke to some folks from uh, St. Louis and Milwaukee and Kansas City and some of the other uh, maker um, movement, maker areas, and a lot of them said, if you build it, they will come, you know, the field of dreams approach. We don't see that here. We're, uh, our community, when we've, when we've done things and we've tried to say, look, this is what we're doing, we don't get the kind of feedback that we think we would see from a, if you build it, we will put it. <coughs> If we build it, they will come approach. Um, if anybody is interested in, in helping us and in, in getting on the board, um, we'll, we're more than willing to just talk to you afterwards and see if we can't make it work. Um, we're, we've got a couple irons in the fire right now that are we're real close. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's just a, a matter of, you know, we might, we might be able to open our doors next year. It's just a matter of getting the things that we need uh, lined up. Sorry, I got that. Thank you. <laughs> Is there an area you don't go into, like medical? Uh, that I personally don't go into, or no, makers? Or? Your group, the makers. Uh, no, um, uh, as a maker, as a maker space, we would be, you know, a, a, as long as it's safe to the people around it, we're, we'll allow it. Um, I think chemistry would be one we'd step back from. Um, you know, have a, a have a fume hood and all that stuff, and we can pull it off, yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it, there's not really any place, makers come in all shapes and sizes and varieties, so there's not really something that would hold us back, um, as long as it's safe for the people in the building. Uh, if, for example, let's say we, let's say the Rogers Public Library said tomorrow, this is your maker space, have at it, run with it. There wouldn't be any welding, we, we'd throw that out the door. Um, we'd probably think real hard and, about uh, wood cutting because of all the sawdust. I mean, we'd have to we'd have to bend to what the space would allow. Uh, but if if we stuck a building, you know, across the street, built it from scratch, and we're ready to rip and ready to go, you know, the sky's the limit as long as we can afford it and it doesn't hurt anybody we're hoping for. It. That's why I said I'd like a kitchen. I, when, this time of year always gets me baking cookies, and, so I'm the cook in the house. Ken Corkum had a question for you. I think. Well, my, oh, my yes. question was, I have to preface this by saying that I grew up with our telephone attached to the wall. Yes. <laughs> so how did you develop that guitar? What, what is the process? What is the process? Um, I stole it from an idea. Well, I understand <laughs> I just want to be honest. I, I can understand that. But what did you, what materials did you have? What? Gotcha. I can tell you the whole story, no problem. So, so the guitar itself design is another person designed the actual physical body, this really cool zigzag pattern. Um, and they actually shared it on a website called Thingiverse. The, it was meant to be printed as one piece, but as large as it is, it doesn't fit in my printer. Um, the way that he designed it, there's programs called CAD CAMs, computer aided drawing, computer aided manufacturing. Uh, those programs, think of them as uh, Photoshop or, or picture imaging, but only in three dimensions, so length, width, height. Um, once that software spits out a file, there's files of all sorts that run in 3D printers, there's STLs, there's OBJs. Um, I can tell you what those stand for, but they're, they're too hard to pronounce, some of them. Um, but basically that file is, is a universal language that things like 3D printers and CNC machines can talk. And they basically, it tells the computer which way to go. So I actually warmed up my printer a second ago. It's going to print me a chain here in a second. Um, basically, it tells the machine to go left, right, up, down, sideways, sideways, whatever. Over the course of time, it prints out the actual thing, the, the physical object that it, you know, it looks like. The um, other parts, 
like the, the pick guard and the knobs. I actually designed those from scratch in a CAD CAM software. And once that's all designed, you feed it to the machine and it takes the STL file and it runs with it. Um, what it basically does is this particular printer works with plastic. There's many different types of printers out there and we'll, we can talk about them in a second. The, the material, and anybody that's done lawn work will know what I'm talking about, looks like weed whacker wire. Um, this is a PLA, PLA or polylactic acid, um, basic plastic that it's good for printing indoors. There's other plastics like ABS we've all heard about. Uh, there's even a polystyrene, there's nylons. Um, there's even uh, plastic printers now that can print in uh, wood type material that's plastic infused with wood powder. That material is sandable and paintable and all that stuff. Um, once, it, once the machine eats that up, it's actually sitting behind this drawer right here. I'm going to explore right here if everybody can see it. Let me move the, the gears. Um, that is heated up to 230 degrees Celsius. It's 1.75 millimeters thick when it goes in, and it's 0.3 or less coming out. Um, this particular printer has a resolution as high as 0.1 millimeters per layer. So basically it's going to draw a line and drop 0.1 millimeters. The bed actually drops down 1.1 millimeters, and then it draws another line, and so on and so forth. Um, think of it as uh, if you've ever played with a hot glue gun. You kind of, you can, you can sit there and draw a wall if you wanted to, just keep moving your hand up. Uh, but only this one's way more precise. So is that printing right now? It, I just started, yep. So it's going to print out a chain. Um, the, the very first MakerBot is called the Cupcake. Uh, this particular industry started with what they call the Cupcake. They ceremoniously named it the Cupcake because their very first printer worked with icing. And they put cake icing in it because they didn't need to heat it up. It was already liquid and it just squirted out and icing gets a little bit solid once it's in the air, you know. They can sit there and draw a line or whatever. Um, so, as you can see, it's going to move back and forth really fast. This thing actually gets going really fast. Um, whenever it gets going on some of my bigger projects, the whole thing starts to shimmy on the table. <laughs> so, this is one of my, one of three machines that I own. Um, this is the, the big shiny one, so I like to bring that out and show people. Um, once, it, once it's done printing, it, go, it comes out at 230 degrees Celsius. Once it comes out, it cools almost instantly. There's a little fan that blows on it. I can pick it up and move it. It's not a problem. Um, so yeah, does that answer your question? Yes, kind of. Okay. Uh, years ago, in the biological lab, in the medical labs now, you do section, which is mm -hmm. microns thick, and you can go through something and then put it back together and see what the actual structure is. Is that really what we're talking about? Exactly, only we're going reverse. We're, we're building those sections. Um, so other types of printers actually would show off more. Uh, the 3D plastic printers are kind of the easiest one to sell the market because the material is easy to produce, it, it's easy to carry. Um, but there's other printers that actually print in a powder. Uh, it's more of a gypsum powder, kind of like the walls. It's a gypsum powder or a plastic powder. And it will actually lay a, a half a, probably a half a micron of powder down, and it prints glue on top of it in the powder. Instead of injecting out the plastic, it, print, it spits out the glue. That is done layer after layer after layer, and then you pull out a physical object. Yeah, um, and the cool did, thing about that is it's full color. How did you create the program to get that for you I, I did not. I, so, well, but somebody did. Right, somebody did. So it, it, there's a ton of CAD CAM software out there. CAD CAM software has been out probably 60s and 70s. It started being produced um, to make a three-dimensional object in the, you know, in the computer world. Um, and then that software has been, you know, run with. There's open source software. One of my favorite websites of all time is Tinkercad. Um, if you've ever played with Paint on on Windows, the basic Paint program, Tinkercad's the same thing, but only for, you know, 3D objects. Um, you physically just move around spheres or boxes and carve them. And, CAD and is you know. computer assisted design. Yeah. And the other one. CAM is computer aided um, manufacturing. Manufacturing, thank you. Yeah. So I didn't actually produce the software. Other, they've been making it since the 60s and 70s. Well, I just how have how access to it. create the software. If I have a teacup mm -hmm. and I want to, 
how do you create a program that will form another peak? Oh, I see. Okay. So it, there's a, um, what's the G code? Um, so whenever you have the physical object in the, in the CAD CAM world, the STL file, the software that comes with the printer, and there's also open source versions of this, creates what's called a G code. It basically says, go this way for two seconds, turn right, go this way for, it, it, it turns it into G code for itself. It does it by itself. It's all built in. I think what he's asking is, do you, can you scan a yeah. physical object? Oh, okay, yeah. yes. Okay, yes. We, you can totally 3D scan something. I apologize for that. Or you can draw it yourself. Or you can draw it yourself. So yes, you can 3D scan something. Uh, I didn't bring my 3D scanner here, but I actually have a full body 3D scanner. Um, I do play with my full size 3D scanner. Everybody meet Minnie me. Um, this is a little copy of myself, fully scanned and 3D printed. Um, one of the things that I, I never knew about myself, you, you learn stuff whenever you have a spare head. First off, you lose it all the time. <laughs> Secondly, um, I never knew this about myself, and I've never broke my nose, but I have a crooked nose. And I didn't know that until I 3D printed myself. I look in the mirror every day, I'm like, I didn't know that. Sure enough, my nose is crooked, and I'm like, oh, that's just a print. Yeah, I've printed about seven of my heads now, and sure enough, I, I've got a crooked nose. Oh well. So yeah, you can 3D scan something. Um, the way a 3D scanner works is it will project onto the, the object a grid pattern, simple square grid pattern. And then the camera, it'll have two cameras. It'll have an infrared camera and a regular camera. The regular camera picks up the, the color. The infrared camera picks up the grid. It knows that that grid pattern is coming out in an inch at X amount of feet. So at two feet, that square is an inch. But if it measures that square at and now it's four inches tall, and it knows that it's this far away now. So based on that math, it knows that this, you know, my nose is closer than my eye, my hair sticks up here, so on and so forth, based on how big that grid is. Um, you actually, most scanners, you actually can't see the grid, it's an infrared grid. Um, there are a couple of kids, 3D scanners out there that actually show a green line or a red line on it. Um, but yeah, it, would, it basically it measures the distance between the square lines and says, okay, at, a, at two feet, it's an inch. At six feet, it's going to be this big. So now I know how far away you are, and it, it'll scan. Um, I actually scan my car. There's the front of it. Um, I scanned for um, Children's Miracle Network. I raised over $1,000. I scanned 100 and some odd people and charged them $10 a head. <laughs> and uh, printed out their little heads about two inches tall, and all the money went to charity. So it was a, it was a fun little project. Room. Yeah, we did a bride and groom. Um, I was asked to, we, we scanned the bride and groom in their, her dress and in his suit. Of course, we separated him. He couldn't see the dress. Um, but we scanned them, and then uh, my friend printed them, and we made them their own cake topper. So they were their own cake topper. So, yeah. So, in fact, I'll probably bring it up here in a second. But the, uh, the um, you know, I was actually quite honored. They, they uh, the friend that asked me to do it, didn't have a full body scanner. And so they uh, they brought it up. And it was actually quite nice. We did it in all white plastic. Any other questions while I bring this up? Is your wife as enthusiastic about it as you are? This is my wife right here. <laughs> so, so I, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be kind of honest about this because her and I have been together for 18 years now. Um, she's kind of in the meh form, you know. Um, and, and I don't say that you know I say that lovingly because it's gotten to the point where it's really hard to to surprise her because I do all this stuff and they're like and she's like another one you know she's. <laughs> She's like, when I did the, um, the battle droid took 400 plus hours to print. About halfway through the body, she said, are you going to push the button again? I'm like, yes, I'm going to print again. Because <laughs> as you can hear, it does make a little bit of noise, but it's not very loud. Um, she's kind of to the mad stage. Uh, I built a full-size game cabinet that you can play literally almost any video game out there on with joysticks and all that. And she's like, eh, when I see it playing, okay, I'll play it. You know, I, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of, you know, glazed her over. She's used to it. She's, you know, in the beginning it was cool for her. She'd see something, she'd be like, that's awesome. And now it's like, she just, she's just along for the ride. Where does the printer live? I love it. Well, it's in the dining room. One of them anyway. Yeah. So, so I'm literally eating dinner, check my printer. So, 
Um, let me bring this up. Go ahead. What kind of price is the material? <laughs> what kind of price is the material? Um, so, let's see here. It really depends on what you do. Um, <coughs> Yeah, my battle droid does stand up. He's a little, little worse for wear right now, so he doesn't stand up anymore. Um, so it really depends on where you get the material from. Uh, a typical spool is going to be uh, average about forty dollars for a spool of plastic. Two point two pounds. Two point two pounds. I was going to say one one kilo. Um, And you can see, uh, 3D printers have practical uses too. Those darn light things always break on me. I printed more. Um, <laughs> so, so a typical spool is 2.2 pounds. It, it's uh, about the average of forty dollars. If you look around, one of, one of the key things you got to look for is though, is it good plastic? Um, you you don't want a plastic that's made by a cheap manufacturer. You you may save a little bit of money on it, but you're not going to turn around and actually it'll it'll get dry and brittle and then it'll get all stringy when you print something. Um, the person, my first printer ever was a used printer, and the person said that he can't get anything to print out nice on it, and um, the reason is he had bad plastic. So, oh, yes, yes. There we go, I know what I'm So the, this is my 3D scanner right here that is in the picture. That's, I call it the Dinomatic. Um, <laughs> uh, the 3D scanner that I use is uh, called 3D Sense. It's $400. Uh, they have a, a version that's handheld like the Didomatic. Um, I only call it the Didomatic is because I've added the screen to the back of it so I can see what I'm doing instead of having to look over the laptop. But the um, the scanner is handheld. There's also a version that can slap on the back of an iPad. It's about four hundred dollars as well, but it's way more portable. It's actually got a little clip for it. And you can also hack a Connect to do it. Uh, Xbox Connect is a, a wonderful little toy. That's actually how my head was scanned in this version. Um, so there's no sound in this video, so not a big deal. Uh, but there's the cake topper. <coughs> That's her in her dress and him in his suit. Uh, we did scan them separate, so what we did was we had her hold a pole, a monopod camera pole, in order to make sure her arm was in the right place because we scanned her the first time and her arm kept going like this. And a blurry picture as a snapshot isn't so bad, but a blurry thing like that, she looked like she had a wing. Because it, it scanned her the whole way down, and it just was this big blur. So we had to rescan. So as you can see, I'm going around the person and scanning her inch by inch. And you'll see whenever I come around, there's a little video of it, but there's a long cable that runs to it. Um, I was sworn to secrecy. I wasn't allowed to produce the video until after her wedding, which was a month later. So this was, uh, what, spring? Spring this year? Yeah. According to the day was May. Yeah. Well, that's when I, I posted the Diddlematic. The video wasn't out until probably mid-summer, but I scanned her in May-ish. I think it was at the end of May I scanned her. Um, so you don't have to be that precise on the distance? No, that's the really cool thing about the scanner. Um, it's projecting the grid that knows the difference. So it can just kind of go and see there. I'm looking at the screen. It's a lot easier than looking over here. And once you do that, it... Uh, and you can see how she's, her dress, and you get all the way to the floor. And, and you're faster than that now, right? Well, full body, I, I took my time on the dress. I didn't want to make a mistake. It is her wedding for wedding topper. <laughs> so I took my time. Um, but yeah, so that's how it does that. Um, back to the materials thing. Uh, there's uh, different ways to get plastic. You can make your own. There's machines called extruders that you can actually grind up plastic and put it in. I actually save all of my scraps, 
when I come around here somewhere. Um, I save all the little scraps that come off the printer, and one of these days I'm gonna, if I ever get a Struder, I'm gonna grind it up and make my own, um, recycle it. Um, you can actually find it as low as about $25 a spool. So $200 printer, $25 for your full, first spool, not too shabby. So, and there you go. So that, uh, that uh, scanner you're using, it realizes northeast, south, and west as it's going around and knows exactly where it is where you're doing uh, it. Yeah, I guess you could say that. It doesn't really care about the actual north and south no, and stuff. I mean, it knows, but it knows, it knows the front burner for the back burner and all that stuff. As it's, as it's scanning her, there's the big top around the cake. Um, as it was scanning her, it, it knew that this side of her head had a line around it because I, I got around there. It knew that, that each dot was attached. Um, So there's the cake topper. We printed it in all white. And um, this particular plastic is called ABS, which a lot of your cups and things are made of. And you can actually smooth it. So we smoothed them out. And as you can see, her arm was through there. We just, in the design, it's like Photoshop. I just cut out the pole. And then he was scanned. We didn't show him me and scan. It's not the fun part. Um, he was scanned with his arm like this so that we could get it right. Um, and then we, we uh, my friend put the bottom on it. And, so. Any other questions real quick? We got one time for one more. Um, what was the price? For, you said you did each of those heads for about $10. Yes. Um, for $10. What was the price of the materials you used for each head? Uh, so because it was a charity, we, we charged ten dollars a head because we'd ask a bunch of our a bunch of people in the office how much would you pay and ten was the sweet spot. To actually make them it was less than a buck to for plastic. So the, the plastic wasn't wasn't that much. We plastic plus time. I did a hundred plus heads. It took me two weekends to, to print them all out. And I mean solid. It just kept printing. Like she said, is you gonna print anything? So so yeah, it was it was it was a good raise of money. So so well, I really want to thank you guys for having me. Um, I, if I have a couple of minutes at the end, they can all come over. Anyone that wants to, yeah. but before you do that, let's give Tyson a big hand.